Our agenda for today, we're going to talk a little bit about the year in review. We're going to do a hack demo and a Wi-Fi attack video. We're going to talk a little bit more about tools and techniques that we can use to protect ourselves and more about security within the county. So let's start with the year in review last year. By the way, this is a real picture from World War II. What does that mean? It means that you cannot trust anything you see anymore with Photoshop, right? <laughs> so the year 2014 saw the term data breach become very popular in public vernacular. This is according to the Verizon Data Breach Report. In the New York Times, there were 700 articles about data breaches versus 125 the year before. Vulnerabilities all received major logos. This one's called the Heartbleed vulnerability. They needed PR firms to handle them. You hear about them all the time on the news now. They give them cute names. And of course, high profile organizations were met with the inevitability of the breach so that now cybersecurity is at the boardroom level, which is a really huge thing. But most importantly from last year, mom finally understands what it is I do. Now, my mom is still around, of course, but you see stuff uh, happening uh, on TV and, and data breaches and that sort of stuff. And Oh, is that what you do, dear? So last year, 2014, 1 billion, 23 million records stolen, 116,000 records every hour, 32 records every second. Now, the bulk of those breach incidents types were identity theft as well as done by malicious outsiders. And we're going to talk a lot about identity theft today. We're going to talk about what's involved in it and how you can better protect yourself from the impact of it as well. The other thing that we're seeing consistently, and we talked about this in last year's presentation, about how when bad guys get inside networks, especially corporate networks, the last thing they want is to be caught. So what do they do? They don't advertise their presence. They lay like a snake in the grass. And so they can exfiltrate the data or the information that they need. And so they're hiding. The average number of days last year where bad guys were sitting on an internal network before they were discovered was 205 days. Let's talk about a couple of notable breaches here that happened last year. The first one most of you are familiar with, the Sony breach. This was uh, evidently or supposedly about North Korea being unhappy about this film. Although there was a lot of concern in the security community about the uh, validity of that particular attribution, because attribution is really, really hard in terms of who actually did something. But these people showed up one day and they had this on their screen and all their data was just sucked right out of that company and put out on the internet. This is a screenshot of what some of the files uh, looked like that were stolen. And of course, they even got access to the mainframe so they could see how much actors were making. But this one hits home more, the Anthem attack. Right? How many people here have received a written letter from Anthem? Yep, every time I've taught this course so far, most of the room lifts their hands. 80 million Americans were affected, and these breaches, especially this one, have led to identity theft. I'll show you some examples about that in just a couple minutes. Uh, people having problems filing taxes, that sort of a thing. Healthcare, though, was the industry that had the most number of data breaches last year. 42% uh, of all the breaches involved healthcare. A lot of the reason for that is because we know about the medical health record, right? And we know it's all over the place, the electronic medical record. And we know that some organizations that use it have good security, but a lot of the smaller clinics don't. And so this is an actually scary statistic from Forbes. That particular graphic, the number of increase in healthcare records that are being stolen on a regular basis. Average cost of $12 billion for U.S. hospitals, about $2 million per hospital to clean up after these things. And one other breach I want to mention that happened since 2014 is the Office of Personnel Management, the federal government level. This is still a really big deal. This is uh, still in the news. If you've ever had a federal background check done or had a federal fingerprint done, then you're also a victim of this particular hack as well. So, it's interesting how quickly, once information gets out, how quickly it gets around on the internet. Once it's stolen or leaked out onto the internet, how quickly it moves. And a company called BitGlass actually did an experiment recently where they produced a fake list of 1,500 employees, which included their social security numbers, uh, credit card information, address, various other kinds of information. It was a fake list. And they watermarked that with some code so that when they released the file out on the internet, if somebody opened that file, that file would phone home back to them and let them know who opened it. Let them know as much information they can about the person's computer, their location, that sort of a thing. They released this puppy. It took 12 days to travel to 22 different countries and five of the world's seven continents. 
So it's amazing how quickly this information moves around. So let's talk a little bit about identity theft, because this is a really huge issue these days. People wanting to steal your identity and use it to make money, basically, is what this is all about. And one of the big ones is tax refund fraud, where the bad guy steals your information, okay, and then files a fraudulent return with the IRS. And the way things are set up right now, they can do that. And then what happens is, is that the IRS issues a refund to that person. And then all of a sudden, you try to do the exact same thing with a legitimate return, and the IRS says, oops, we messed this one up, and then there's a mess. You see what I'm saying? But they don't see it until after the legitimate person files. Identity theft is becoming so common that they have books like this now. The Idiot's Guide to Recovering from Identity Theft. You know, how to get yourself out of this mess that, that, that you're not responsible for getting yourself into necessarily. And it's serious. People are getting medical claims denied. They're having their lives ruined. You can read online stories about people who have had their identity stolen and were unable to recover in such a bad manner that for them that they ended up committing suicide. It's pretty serious stuff. So later on, we're going to talk about some of the ways you can really reduce the impact of identity theft for your own self personally. On the other hand, there are people who don't worry about identity theft because thieves have better spending habits than they do. So sphere phishing is still the number one attack vector. To get inside of a network, okay, they go after you. They want to get you to do something that you would not normally do to give them access to your computer remotely so they have a foothold inside of your network. According to this, the Verizon Data Breach Report, 90% of all incidents is people related. You're the target. You're the way the bad guys get in. If you haven't seen it yet, check out the uh, new television show called Mr. Robot. The security community actually loves that show because the hacking in it is actually, for the first time ever in human history, it's accurate. What you see on screen is true. It really is the tools that are used and the way it's done. It's, it's a fascinating show. You'll see that the target, the biggest target of hackers is people. He's, he says it during the show, I hack people. That's the way you get inside of organizations. That's the way you steal information. So the way it is, if you look at it from a graphical perspective here, why would a bad guy try to go after a hardened data center where all that information is there when he can get access to your account because of your activity and then he has access to everything you have access to? So there's no need to go after necessarily the, the hardened servers or that sort of thing. It's about stealing accounts and using your account, impersonating you to get access to what they need to get access to. Now this is a really interesting concept. A friend of mine who does a lot of testing for organizations where they test the security of their networks and of their people, a lot of times when he goes to an organization to do this, the CIO or the person in charge will tell everybody in the organization, don't anybody click on anything for the next two weeks because we're being tested, right? So people don't click on stuff. Well, how does he get in? He actually takes a legitimate icon from the organization and puts it on a DVD that looks like that, it says reorganization plan, and drops it in the parking lot. 75% of the time, he gets into that network because somebody's got to pick that thing up and look and see what the reorganization plan is all about. You can do this also if you change that to layoff plan. You know, people are going to want to know. It's a great way to get inside of, of networks, uh, it, it really is. Organized crime continues to rule the roost. Over 80% of cyber attacks are driven by organized crime rings. These are people who are very talented. They work very well together. They create these things called toolkits, we've talked about them before, that give them not only a tremendous amount of information about where they have been successful in their attacks, it gives them business intelligence, they rent these things out, they provide technical support. I mean, it's, it's, a full, it's a whole industry here, folks. 143 million pieces of malware, according to Kaspersky, created by cyber criminals last year. You can see why being an antivirus vendor might be a nightmare, keeping up with that sort of thing. And it's really basically impossible to do. So here in the county in 2014, we had 813,000 security events. What does that mean? Those weren't security incidents, those events where we have to look at them and see, is this something that's successful? That's what our team spends most of the time doing, is that very thing. And out of that, we had 146 security incidents and 56 kills. Kills means when you have in a, a piece of malware that gets past antivirus, antivirus doesn't recognize it, and it happens all the time. 
and it gets onto a system and the system gets infected and the only safe way to put that system back into service is to completely wipe it and rebuild it so that we call that a kill. So it's 56 of them last year. I want to talk a little bit about cloud computing before we get into our demos. And most folks, if I were to walk around this room and ask you what cloud computing is, I'd probably get a different answer from just about everybody. And a lot of people even think that this is what cloud computing is about. But I'm a big fan of cloud computing in the sense that it actually gives you instantaneous disaster recovery for a lot of your data if you're doing it right. It gives you a lot of features and a lot of security that you can use. Uh, but this is one of my favorite slides about describing cloud computing. And I'm not going to get into the, the slide in detail right now, but you'll be able to see it online uh, later if you want to check it out. It talks about the different services of cloud computing, infrastructure, platform, and software as a service, and compares them to pizza, take and bake, pizza delivery, that sort of thing. So you can really get a better grasp on cloud computing and what it's all about if you want to check this out. But these data centers are pretty solid things. This is Google's data center here. Um, this is another picture of a Google data center. There's a lot of security in these environments. And this is Amazon's AWS data center. And people are putting their data into these data centers all the time. Okay? They're uploading their information. Most of the data that you probably have on your smartphone or your tablet is probably being stored up in a cloud environment. And a lot of these environments can be very secure. Some of them can't, but most of them can be. Here's the issue, though. If you're storing information up in the cloud where it's secure, how are you going to access that information? Are you going to take your laptop and drive out to this data center and plug it in the back of the server and get access to it? No. You're going to access that information on your computer, either here in the county, at home, on your laptop, on your tablet, on your smartphone. So why would a bad guy go after a hardened data center, again, when all he has to do is go after you and your endpoint to get access to your data? There's famous last words. It's encrypted. It's behind the firewall. OK, say the data is encrypted. Can you read encrypted data? No, of course not. We have to have it decrypted for us to use it. And if your encryption key is your password and the bad guy steals your account, then he has access to the same information. Encryption doesn't matter then. The other thing is, oh, well, it's behind a firewall. Well, if you take a look at these devices nowadays and the information that's now on them, where's the firewall now? The perimeter is changing. It's a whole different world out there. And so it's not as simple anymore. But that's one of the reasons why the bad guys, like I said before, go after us as, as end users. So the endpoint is the target, and you are the target. So let's do some demos here. The first demo I want to, actually one demo, and then I'm going to show you a video. Um, this demo is about privilege escalation and how we make it easy on cyber criminals. This is Darth Vader's computer. Really, it is. Running Windows 7, fully patched, up to date. Now, Darth Vader is the kind of guy who likes convenience, OK? He wants it easy for him to get access to whatever he needs to get access to. If he wants to install some software on that system, he wants just to be able to do it. He doesn't want to be prompted for higher level credentials to do higher level stuff. He's a convenience guy, okay? So as a result of that, Darth Vader runs, his account on his computer runs as what's called administrator. And most of you are familiar with the concept of administrator versus regular user. But he's an administrator on this system. Now, we have sent Darth Vader a very special file. This is a file called Death Star Vulnerabilities. Now, he's something he's very interested in because he needs to protect this Death Star against a rebel attack, right? So what's he going to want to do? He's going to want to open this. However, when we sent this file, we created it so that when he runs it, it's going to create a backdoor, and it's going to phone home to his computer. It's going to phone home to our computer, the attackers, and give us access to his computer in his account. So here goes Darth Vader. He's going to run this file. And he does so, he's going to check out the Death Star vulnerabilities. Meanwhile, back at our attacker's computer, we have an interactive session, wherever we are in the world, we'll be in Belize today, with his computer. We're logged in as Vader, as you can see there. So we're going to run some commands. And our goal here is to steal the password hashes that are on this system so we can use those password hashes to move around the network. You can see that these commands, you don't have to worry about exactly what they are, but we're migrating to a system process here. See how simple and easy and quick this is, and how we were able to get those password hashes that fast. Because he's logged in as administrator. Yoda, on the other hand, is a little wiser. Yoda realizes that sometimes convenience isn't necessarily the best thing. He realizes that if an attacker gets access to his account, 
what kind of things you could do, and maybe that there needs to be something that keeps the attacker from gaining that high level access so easily. So as a result of that, on his Windows computer, Yoda runs as a standard user. So we're just going to do the exact same thing against Yoda here. We sent the exact same file to Yoda, and now well, he really needs to see that because they're preparing the rebel attack, right? So he runs that file, we get the exact same access to his computer, and we're in as Yoda. And we're going to run the exact same commands to try to grab those password hashes off his computer. Well, here's the problem. We try to run these same commands, and we'll give it a second here to run, and we get errors. Not in the admins group, cannot escalate with this particular module. So the next thing we'll try to run, we'll try to uh, change our process and try to see if we can steal those password hashes that way. We'll migrate our process and do the same thing. No, cannot migrate, insufficient privileges. And what you're seeing here is that we've made it harder for the attacker to get access to the stuff we needed because we've lowered our privilege on the system. Okay, so where's all this going? There's a really good concept in terms of talking about least privilege, and that's the concept of an automobile valet key. Most of you are probably familiar with a valet key. If you give this to a valet, it will start the car, open the left-hand door, but it will not allow the person who's driving the car access to your glove box or your trunk where you might have something valuable. So you're seeing you're giving them access to the car, but at a lesser level of privilege. Well, the same thing can apply to your computing on a day-to-day -day basis. If we run as a lower level account, and then when we need to do something important, we elevate our privileges by maybe putting in a different password, then we make it harder for an attacker. The same thing goes for day-to-day -day stuff. It's really important that if you're working on a county computer that has access to protected information that you don't use that same account for your casual internet browsing and casual personal email use because that's the vector where people get the most attacked. You want to make it hard for a bad guy in case you do get compromised for them to get access to the juicy stuff. The same thing goes at home. Don't do your banking on your kid's computer. You know, for sure. Keep that stuff separate. It's really, really important to do that. Same thing, you know, keep, uh, do the best you can to make sure that your day-to-day -day account usage, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but you're not using the same password and the same username in all your account places because it makes it really easy for the attacker to get in. So that's least privilege. The next video I want to show you is person in the middle wireless and why you will never use Wi-Fi again after today. This is from one of the most brilliant people in the security industry. He's from uh, Sophos across the pond. I introduce to you Mr. James Line. Right now, you're vulnerable to cyber criminals, and the odds are it's your own fault. We're going to show you why. Throughout our journey across New York City, we'll be offering up a variety of wireless hotspots, named things like Get Online or Free Public Wi Fi. Now, the equipment to do this is surprisingly lightweight just a couple of computers, a mobile hotspot, and a wireless network adapter. And we'll be using this to demonstrate how you are making life easy for cyber criminals. Here we are in JFK Airport, one of the busiest airports in the world. Now it's hard to conceive of a place that has more dense wireless traffic, with all around us thousands of people looking for a wireless hotspot to get online, check their email or apply their latest social media update. In fact, just right here, I'm seeing 31 different wireless networks. Now some of them are just numbers and letters randomly generated, others look like printers, and some of them profess to offer free internet. What's really interesting is we've all become experts at quickly scanning this list to pick out the one that's most likely to get us online. Now this is a bit of a trust indicator, but in reality this is just a bit of text that anyone can type in and pretend to be anyone else they'd like to be. That's exactly what we're going to be exploiting in our journey in New York City. During our hour and a half at the airport, 391 people connected to our hotspots. That's several hundred potential victims. Now we've driven over to Brooklyn, 
and on the way we've been offering up our various hotspots. So far we've managed to snare 768 users into connecting. But one of the hotspots in particular is extremely concerning. This particular hotspot requires credit card details in order to get online. Now we're charging about $2 for 24 hours access. Of course, in this case, we're not actually taking the money. But 109 users happily handed their credit card details over to a complete stranger, a company they've no idea about. In this case, me. Now we're being ethical in this experiment, but imagine for a moment we weren't. If we were to take just $100 from those 109 people, that would be $11,000 for just a few hours work. It's easy to see how careless behaviors of users are constantly lining the pockets of cyber criminals. So you, or one of your employees, connects to a wireless network. What's the big deal? I mean, we all do it. The problem is, when you connect to a wireless network, you're handing over authority on where your information goes on the internet to the owner of that device. Which means if you request a website, they're in a position to modify it or serve you a fake copy. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. I'm using a copy of the Social Engineering Toolkit to create a clone of a very popular website. Now this could be a website where you have to hand over information like credit card details, a login to a work email, or anything else. In this case, on this particular website, I'm using an SSL certificate, so there's the recognizable padlock that all users know to trust. All that really says is your information is encrypted on the way to the cyber criminal, me. Now I'm gonna just log in here with my normal username and password, and immediately on the attacker's screen, we can see my login and password over here. So this shows us exactly why it's critical to make sure you're protecting yourself all the time. Over the last couple of days, we've toured New York City, offering up our wireless hotspots, named the likes of free public Wi-Fi or Get Online. During that period, 2,341 people have connected to our various networks, with a little over 54% of them being mobile devices. As well as that, 109 people were happy to hand over their credit card information to a complete stranger. And there were over 800 page requests to websites that were infected and distributing nasty malicious code. For more compelling data from our study, see our white paper right here. Pretty awesome stuff. Uh, thanks to Sophos and James Lyon for permission to use that. If you are into TED Talks, Definitely go online and check out his TED Talk. It's really, really awesome. So what do we do about that? Can we protect ourselves? Yeah, we actually can. There's a number of different things we can do. Let's talk a little bit about Wi-Fi safety in general here. Be sure, first of all, that the Wi-Fi access point that you are connecting to is legitimate. Really, really, really important. That's just a basic fundamental. And I, the last two hotel trips that I've had, I've run into this problem. Look at this, the Marriott. Which one's the real Marriott guest Wi-Fi network? How can you tell? Which one's the real holiday in Sacramento? Well, one of them's misspelled, but how many people are just going to click on something misspelled? Maybe do the same thing at Starbucks, right? So the first thing is to make sure it's legitimate. Go to the hotel front desk, get them to provide you with a written copy of exactly the right one that you're supposed to connect to. Same thing if you're going out and you're connecting up at Starbucks or wherever you're connecting. Make sure it's a legitimate site. Second thing that you can do, and this is a really important thing, especially if you travel a lot and you are doing things that are important on your computer, which a lot of people, you know, they do their banking on their tablets and their phones and that sort of a thing. And if you're on the road and you're doing that, you really want to make sure you're well protected. Uh, VPN is really definitely the way to go here. Now, when I talk about VPN, I'm not talking about necessarily the VPN that we use in the county here when we connect to our computers, although that is VPN and it will do the same thing. I'm talking about personal VPN here, where you can sign up with a company, and these are not free, but they're not expensive either. Like this one is the one I use, it's about 30 bucks a year. And what it does is you, you basically create a trust relationship between your computer or your tablet and these companies, and everything's encrypted between your device and the company, and then after that it gets sent out unencrypted. So if you're on a Wi-Fi access 
access point somewhere and you really need to do something and you're not 100% sure, the bad guy can't actually sniff your data and see what you're doing because the transmission is encrypted. So this particular company is one of them here. There's uh, several of them. This is another one called Hotspot Shield. Definitely worth looking into. If you have to connect to a network and you're not sure about it, if something pops up on the screen and wants you to log in, just, you know, oh, you need to re-log into your Facebook account. Just don't do it. Uh, be aware of those situations that the bad guys are going to use those tactics and techniques against you. Don't log on to your bank's website. We'll talk a little bit more about protecting your logins in a minute as well. Uh, here's that minute. Let's talk about authentication and password stuff because, unfortunately, passwords haven't gone away yet. And it's becoming easier and easier to crack passwords, too. Quantum computing is now available in the cloud to the end user. The ability to crack passwords faster than ever. But this particular slide, this is from the XKCD comic, it best illustrates, I think, the whole password complexity issue. And it states that through 20 years of effort, we've successfully trained everyone to use passwords that are hard for humans to remember but easy for computers to guess. So here's a good example, top left corner, that Troubadour password. That's pretty complicated, right? You would think that's a good password. Well, turns out to a computer it's not. It only has 28 bits of entropy, so at 1,000 guesses a second, which you can do on a laptop these days, it would take three days to guess that password. But how difficult is it for the human to remember that password? It's hard. I mean, it says there, was it a trombone? Was it a troubadour? Where there was some symbol? It's just hard to remember those kinds of passwords. On the other hand, look at the password on the bottom left. Correct horse battery staple. Four common random human words with spaces in them. How many of you didn't know that you could put spaces in your password? And that's where the poll passphrase concept we've talked about before. Using a phrase, uh, words from a poem or a favorite song, and then change it a little bit, add some entropy to it, make it something special to you. It makes it very, very difficult to crack. This particular password here has 44 bits of entropy. So at 1,000 guesses per second, about 550 years of current computing speed to break that password. But see the difference? It's pretty straightforward. And how does he remember it? The horse says that's a battery staple, and he says correct. That's how he does it. Now, we do recommend you use password managers that keep encrypted vaults of all your difficult to remember passwords. If you have a lot of passwords, they're great ways to memorize. Then you just have to remember the one passphrase that you need to get inside. And if you lose that passphrase, as we said in the past, your life is probably over. But if you remember it, they're great tools to use. The other issue with passwords, though, really is about reuse. Now, think about this. If you have a particular account, say it's Twitter, Bad guy get access to your Twitter account and you have a certain password there. Well, he's going to be able to determine all your other social media sites, right? It's easy to do that. It's easy to find out that information about people. If he tries that same username and password against all those things, is he going to get in, he or she? And that's a good question. You want to make sure you're using different credentials for all your different accounts. But more importantly, you want to look into two-factor authentication. And we've talked about this in the past. When I log in on my computer to the bank, it asks me for my username and password. Okay, that's something I know. Then what happens is it sends me a text message to my phone, which is something I have, and I have to enter the code that they send me on that same page before they'll let me in. Because they want to know not just do you know the password, because that's stealable, but also do you have your phone. That's called two-factor authentication. The third factor is something you are, like a fingerprint. But remember, it takes two factors at least to create two-factor authentication. So me logging into this phone here just using my thumb, that's just one factor of authentication. But you can see, again, it's just a different kind of factor. This particular website is really cool. It's called twofactorauthentication.org. It's a place where you can go to see if two-factor is available at your bank or various other sites. It's available on Twitter. It's available on Facebook. It's available on YouTube. Definitely sign up for it with your banks if you can. If they, if they offer it, if not, maybe check out a bank that does, because it does add a, a, another important layer of security. This particular website uh, will give you a lot of information. This particular one is very interesting, the banking section. It shows that Bank of America and Chase have two-factor authentication, but American Express and Capital One don't. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> Let's get with the 21st century. Uh, you can actually tell your bank or your, uh, your company that you're uh, doing business with to support two-factor authentication from this website. 
Now, where are passwords going? Hopefully away. The concept of authentication is starting to move more towards visual authentication. Because if you start using pictures that people recognize and patterns of pictures and f relationships of pictures, people remember pictures better than they do words. And if you have a relationship that you know in your mind, mathematically that becomes way harder to crack. It really, really, really does. So let's talk about more tools and techniques for home use to protect ourselves. This is for home use. These are not things you need to install here at work, but there are things that you can install at home and these are for the most part free. Most of you are familiar with WebSense, right? Good old WebSense block message. Yeah, I can't go play games on the county network. But what most of us don't realize is WebSense has another feature that's even more important. It blocks from malicious websites. It keeps a blacklist of known malicious websites and won't allow anybody on the county network to get to those websites. And that's a really important thing to have. Most people, however, don't have a WebSense installation at home. So how can you get that kind of feature where somebody's looking out for you and, and maybe keeping you from accidentally going to a site where your system can get infected? This particular company here called OpenDNS is really popular in the security community and it is definitely a, a solid company and their service is free for your use at home and all you have to do is go here and follow the instructions Go home, set it up in your router, and it will provide you that kind of security right out of the bat for free. There are also some other services that it provides with a little bit more money, including parental controls. But definitely check the service out. Open DNS. Um, set it up at home. It's really worth having. Let's talk a little bit about browser and system security tools. Last year, we talked about a particular tool, and I showed you how to use it, where you could install this tool on your computer, your Windows computer, and it would check to see if all your software is up to date because it's really important to have that software up to date. makes it harder for an attacker to exploit something against your computer system if your computer's up to date. And uh, this particular one is called Qualys Browser Check. It's also free, but this one actually installs in your browser. You can install it in Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox, and you can install the plugin, and it will check the status of your browser. It'll see if your browser's up to date, if your browser plugins are up to date, and if they're not, it'll actually allow you to just click a button and then be able to update those things. So it makes it much easier to know that your computer's more secure. You can also uh, check your operating system, whether or not your firewall's on, and it'll also check things like Office, this iTunes, that sort of a thing. So it's, it's a pretty useful tool, and again, it's a free download as a plug-in for your browser. Check it out for sure. Another one for Windows users, this is also a free download, it's called Malwarebytes. And this actually gives some pretty advanced defenses uh, that are not provided naturally by Windows without installing some other plugins and that sort of stuff. We're seeing a little bit more of this kind of technology get put into more modern operating systems like Windows 10. But at the same time, this is available for a free download. Check this out as well. The other thing that's really important is to know what's going on in your computer, right? What happened earlier when we got inside of Yoda's computer? He ran a program. And he probably saw some information. Maybe it was fake information about Death Star vulnerabilities, but it was information. And what happened when he ran that program? His computer phoned home to us, but he didn't realize that it was doing it. It happened invisibly. That's how it works. Bad guy gets the connection to your computer. You have no idea that connection's there. Well, how can you better see what your computer's doing? It's really good to know what your computer's doing because everything you see on it isn't necessarily what's going on. So there's a couple of programs that I recommend. Every year I have people come up to me afterwards and say, I'm a Mac user, why don't you talk about something for me? Well, I'm a Mac user too. I just run a lot of different operating systems on it, including Windows and various other things, because I like the hardware. This particular program here for Mac users is really, really cool. It's called Little Snitch. And what it does is it monitors your connections outbound. And if something happens that you're not aware of or you haven't authorized to happen, it alerts you of it and says, hmm, there's a connection being made to this. Do you want it to happen? That's pretty cool. That's really, really cool stuff to know what your computer's doing. It gives you a lot of information, but most importantly, it prompts you and asks you, and it gives you the ops. You know, yes, I'll allow this to happen forever, or maybe for a temporary period of time, or only to this place. Pretty cool stuff. If you're a Windows user, there's one called Windows Firewall Control that does pretty much the same thing. Uh, definitely a program to check out as well. Again, these are free. Let's talk about identity protection. This was the focus of the beginning of our presentation. Identity protection and how important it really is. Credit monitoring today is no longer an option, folks. Now, is it perfect? No. Is it going to prevent your identity from being stolen? No. 
Can it prevent the exploitation of somebody using your identity? It can help out significantly in that sense. Most of you have probably been, already been offered it for free from the Anthem Breach or maybe some other place. If you haven't, check it out. Sign up for it. The early warning system stuff is really, really important to have. The other thing that you can do, especially if you're really concerned about, say you recently had your identity stolen through something like this and you have some significant concerns about someone utilizing it. And the reason why we should be concerned is because our society still makes it really easy to do things like buy vehicles just like that and open up credit card accounts and open up various other things. It's the whole convenience thing. They want to make it as easy for you as possible. They're willing to take the risk, but are you? And so when I was a kid, the social security number didn't, didn't mean really anything. You could tell anybody. It didn't matter. Now it's like this something that you have to... So you can see there's, the system is a little broken that way. But you can actually sign up for free for these things called file fraud alerts. And these are the four major credit companies in the United States. Most people are familiar with the top three. If you file with Experian, or Equifax, they'll actually take care of the filing for the rest of the folks. And what it does is it removes that convenience for a period of about 45 days. And every 45 days, you've got to tell them, yeah, I still want to do this. But it makes it so it's a little less convenient for a bad guy to open an account in your name. It also makes it a little less convenient for you, but if you're concerned in that situation, it's worthwhile having. So check these out if, if you need to. And the other thing to do is to set up monitoring in your accounts. I have monitoring set up on my bank account, credit card account. Anytime there's a transaction over a dollar, it sends me a message. Okay, That's cool, because every time I buy something, I can see, yep, it's working. It's still sending me the message. But I'll be the first to catch it if somebody does a transaction that I didn't do. So it's really good. You can set these up with your banks, go online, uh, set it up with your credit card companies. Make sure you're getting the alerts of your activity. Really, really important stuff. This particular one was a purchase at PetSmart. That's for this little guy right here. Another really cool site. Well, this particular website here is actually well known in the security community and given pretty much a thumbs up. Where you can go here, you don't have to put in your password or anything, but you can put in a username, whether it's your social media accounts or whatever, or an email address, and you can click and see whether or not your account has been stolen. Because these guys keep lists of just about everything that they can get their hands on. And then you can turn around from there and be able to see, ooh, I need to go change my password really, really, really quickly here. So this is a really interesting site. Definitely check it out. Let's talk a little bit about security in the county in general, and then we're almost done. The information security in the county of Monterey, our goal is really to enable business, and we do that in a couple of major ways. The first thing is, is we spend a lot of time, most of our time is sitting watching for bad guys. Okay, we're watching the network, we're watching the environment, looking for things that are events that could be an intrusion, could be a piece of malware, could be something going on, could be data being stolen, could be something happening. And then we respond to those and put out the fires, right? Where we help put out the fires in that sense. This is a recent picture of Steve and Juan, my teammates, uh, putting out a recent fire here. And the other thing that we spend a lot of time doing is really the role of a security doc. To be, hey, the best thing to do, like this situation here, patch your servers, keep your software up to date. Watch where your accounts have access to. Keep I good identity management. You know, If your people leave the organization, disable those accounts right away. Those sorts of things. Tell them the best things to do. Don't, you know, slow down on the french fries. <laughs> you know, don't smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, that sort of thing. It's kind of like a doctor's situation, but the minute the patient leaves the office, you really don't have any control over what they do. And the reason why that's not a bad thing is because risk is a business decision. It's not a security decision. It's not an IT decision. It's a business decision. That's why it's really important that you get to know someone within your department called your department's information security officer. There are people who we work with there's one inside of just about every department, and that person's job is to know your business really well, and they work with us. And they know your policies and your procedures and the things that are important within your department, the rules and regulations your department falls under, where you should and should not be storing information, that sort of thing. Get to know that person. They're your first point of contact during a security incident or if you see something weird going on in your computer. And of course, as Mr. James Line, um, earlier on the video, like I said, check out his TED Talk. It's pretty awesome. He stated that while you're going to read about malware doing incredible and terrifying, scary things, 99% of it works because people fail to do the basics. And really, if you do the fundamentals, it's like 
It's like the old football saying, if you do the fundamentals, you're going to be successful. Stick to the fundamentals. Really, really important stuff. Now, this is a really important slide because most of us don't want to be the person who walks away from this particular presentation or sometime in the future we, oops, clicked on something and we weren't supposed to and all of a sudden our computer is the source of a major data breach. That would really, really be a bummer, right? That'd just be the worst. We don't want to be that person. We don't want to be the person who's putting county information somewhere or using county information in a way where they don't have written permission to do so. In other words, you, what you want to do is, whatever you're doing with county information, you want to make sure that you are doing it according to the written procedures or you have something in writing from someone in higher levels that says you can do this. So if you're storing it on Dropbox, make sure you have written authentication for doing so. Have a get out of jail card. Really, really, really important to do. Claim you were drunk at the time, but have a get out of jail card. Anytime you're doing anything, make sure that you can say, hey, I was authorized to use information or store information in this way or do things in this way. Same things with your email, that sort of a thing. That's all county information, your county email. So remember that. Make sure you have the authorization in writing. But also don't hide. If you leave, hit your desk, you click on something and something bad happens, you realize, oh, I shouldn't have clicked on that link. Don't crawl under your desk. Give us a call. We're going to probably be like that dog there. Tell you, hey, it's okay. We just want to make sure that your computer is still okay. And if it's not, we want to handle it. We want to deal with it. We want to contain it. So it's a really important thing to remember. And of course, what we tell organizations all the time, avoid becoming a target. People go around and brag about their security. They become big targets or people have stuff. You want to definitely not become a target because as we're learning in the security industry these days, if you do become a target against somebody who really knows what they're doing, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so it, it changes the whole paradigm. So really important thing there. Talk briefly about the future and we are done. According to the SANS Endpoint Security Survey of this year, attackers are bypassing perimeter detection methods with relative ease. More IT professionals are operating under the assumption of compromise because it's just becoming so hard with devices all over the place and people doing stuff with information and traveling all the time, the whole mobility thing, and, and on and on and on and on. You know, it's, it's, it is harder to defend against these things, and what you have to do is look at it differently and think, well, maybe I just need to start looking for the bad guy instead, actively looking. And so what we're talking about here is threat hunting, and this is where security is going. It's about the hunted becoming the hunter. It's actually looking for that bad guy, not just waiting for something bad to happen or for the police or FBI to call you and say, hey, your data's out here on some website. So that's where information security is going, is more to an active defense, shall we say. This is the book, I, one of the books I want to recommend to you if you're into doing some reading about cybersecurity. This particular book was written by Kim Zetter from Wired. It's called Countdown to Zero Day. It's written like a novel. It's fantastic. It's all about Stuxnet which was the advanced piece of malware that was put together by Israel and the United States to go after the Iranian centrifuges and slow down their nuclear program, and it was successful in doing it. This is the story about how that works. It was pre it's a pretty fascinating read. The other one is to check out from Mr. Brian Krebs called Spam Nation. If you want to know more about the criminal underground in cyber, the dark web, nobody knows more about it pretty much than Brian Krebs. And uh, this is pretty fantastic stuff and he's on the front edge his house has been swatted several times by the bad guys in the cyber underworld so pretty interesting stuff there again be very suspicious maintain that suspiciousness that's really important it's really critical to do that that's how we can better protect ourselves is to make sure what you're doing what you're seeing and what you're acting upon is legitimate I also like dogs too you see a lot of cat pictures in my presentation, but this is my uh, dog slide for this particular one. And this is a tribute to the man. Uh, he will be definitely missed. I miss his uh, tweets on Twitter. He was one of the kindest human beings I've ever known. And that's it for this presentation. I want to thank you all for being here. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it.